So we're here at the Barbara Hepworth Museum. Are you sure it looks like a little, normal little house? Well, it does say Barbara Hepworth Museum and Sculpture Garden. Oh, it does. Yes, it does. <gasps> and we see a little Hepworth in the window there. That's beautiful gold. Amazing. Look at it with the colour of the stone, though, Katie. Already you can see that her work echoes everything around her. I know. We can't see the sea from here, but we're surrounded by so many little cottages. This beautiful cobbled street as well. Very steep. You can sense that you're near the sea, though, don't you think? Yes, there's nowhere like this other than near the sea. Hi, I'm Katie Hessel from the Great Women Artists podcast and Instagram, and I'm with my friend, the artist Helen Downey, also known as Unskilled Worker, at the Barbara Hepworth Museum and Sculpture Garden at St Ives in Cornwall. Hi, I'm Unskilled Worker. And this is... Meet Meet Me at at the the museum. Museum! Should we get our national art pass out? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This gets us 50% off the museum. It's amazing. It's pretty good. Yes, it is. Take a bit of money. All right, let's have a look. Which way? I'm excited. So I went to the Barbara Hepworth Sculpture Museum yeah. last summer mm. and I just thought that you would be the perfect person to take. Oh, thank you. You know when you go to someone's house... Yeah. And you just see where they lived and their studio. I just thought you'd find it absolutely fascinating. Yes. I'm really interested to see how her work changed. Yeah. I've known you for what, about... I don't know. Three and a bit years? Yeah, maybe four years now. How long have you had your Instagram account? Four and a half years. So I met you when you were about six months old on Instagram, do you think? And then you were in my first exhibition. Yeah. It's gone quick, hasn't it? And I see you probably about... Three or four times a year. Yeah. And we chat for about seven hours. <laughs> and drink tea. <laughs> and, and coffee. <laughs> and our train journey was about six and a half hours yesterday and we just chatted the whole way. <laughs> it's lovely to get the train here, isn't it? Yeah. It goes from really urban to kind of rolling hills of the West Country to yeah. rocky, rocky Cornwall. Yeah, and all the trees are bent, aren't yeah. they? Have you no- did you notice? They're all yeah. going one way. <laughs> But also interesting, I mean, we came in last night about six mm. and it was the most beautiful kind of twilight. The sky was lavender. Yes. And the moon was so punchy. Yeah. It was so white. Yeah. Somehow. It feels like a sort of magical place in a way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think Barbara Hepworth's work has that, but in a very modern way. Yeah. So many museums are in incredible space you know at Tate's and Ives where we are now you know you go to the front and you can it's you're basically absorbed into the landscape of the sea when you're looking at an artwork and you see the sea reflected how incredible that kind of juxtaposition but also synergy is at the same time yeah I'm excited to explore this with you I'm very excited because you're so passionate and it's when you're walking around (laughs) a museum it's so lovely to be with someone that's passionate isn't it but then I love yeah. going around with artists because you always have a different point of view that I would ever think of. Mm. Maybe, yeah. I'm so excited to see what you think. Thank you very much. Okay. We're standing in the kind of lobby or foyer of the museum, but this must have right. been her hallway or something, considering it's the house. The lady at, at, that works on the desk told me this was her kitchen. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And through here was her bathroom. And then so if we look around us, we're, we've got all these vitrines of her, of her life. I mean, she was born in 1903. I love these childhood pictures of her. They're beautiful. I mean, that was kind of Victorian times. It was. And then look at that early life. She must have been Royal College of Art, 1921. That's her in the back. I mean, she looks so young. She must have been about 17 or 18 she at that does, time. She does, but she also looks so modern. But she was very unusual to look at, wasn't she? Yeah. Oh, look at that marriage. Oh, so she was married before Ben Nicholson as well. He's quite cool, isn't he? Yeah. (laughs) Quite good looking. He is. So I think you were one of my first artists who I followed. Mm. And I remember being so fascinated by your work, and still am, because it's so like nothing I've ever seen before. In a weird way, it's kind of like Renaissance paintings, but then in this modern dream world... Way. Yeah, I loved your account immediately. I mean, at that time, one of one of the joys for me of being on Instagram was learning about art. Yeah. 
um, and seeing what I liked and what I didn't like and then looking at the stories of the artists that I like. You know, you write so well about female artists. At that point, you hadn't actually been painting for that long. No, around two years. Wow. I didn't start painting until I was 48. And then I thought I might paint for a few weeks, but once I started, I just couldn't stop. Yeah. Why did you start painting later in life? Oh, there just wasn't the room for it. Yeah. I needed the space even for the thought to come into my head. And you go under the name of Unskilled Worker, not your real name. No, I hide behind Unskilled Worker. <laughs> <laughs> but their yeah. house is in Hampstead, have you ever seen it? No. Because remember that story I told you about her daughter? Who lived next door to me? Yes. That was amazing. That yeah. time I was doing my recycling. Yes. And this woman came towards me and she was about 85. And she looked so familiar, it was so weird. And then we started chatting for about 10 minutes. And then I said, oh, you know, I'm an art historian. And she said, oh, my family's quite artistic. Quite odd. <laughs> and then took me to her house, pointed to a sculpture. I'd left my door and everything open. And she said, do you know how that is? I said, yes, Barbara Hepworth. She said, that was my mother. What did her you fate. say? What did you say? I'm just on the verge of tears. <laughs> I mean, we're in a kitchen. <laughs> we're in a kitchen. Look at this. Her children, her babies. She had triplets. Did she? Yeah. That's why she often, um, a lot of her work is sort of tripartite forms. Right. She works in threes. Yeah. I wonder if she was fascinated with three before she had the triplets. I've always lived at 33s and 30s. and really? I'm, My birthday's the third of the third. <gasps> so in my artwork, three runs through everything. That's so interesting. Strange. You and Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> when did the fame come? I think the fame came quite early to her. I mean, look at the timeline. She's 1933, she's having visits with Pablo Picasso, Brancusi, and look, already in 1950, she was, yeah, she was 47, but still, you know, she was a woman, you know, whose work was shown at the Venice Biennale. Yeah. That's, like, monumental. Yeah. <gasps> she looks so cool in her fur coat on the front cover of the Sunday Times magazine. When was that? 1965. It's when I was born. <laughs> she really kind of paved the way for women artists and women in general. Shall we go have a look upstairs? Yes. I can't wait to show you. The first time I exhibited in, um, it was in China, in Shanghai, I felt really nervous until I walked into the room where my artworks were hanging and it was as if they were me and I just disappeared. So I feel very protected by my work and I think maybe Barbara did too. From images that I've seen, the work looks in a very protective space. Mm. It's yeah. so interesting you say that because there's also, when you look at the landscape here, mm. it's almost in this embraced, semicircular shape. And it's as though this landscape is kind of protecting everyone in it. And that's what her work does. Yes, it's kind of, so. it's, it's hugging each form. It's very friendly, isn't it? Yeah. You know, that seems like a really kind of light word to use about someone's work, but I often think it's the most loveliest word that you can use about an artist's work, that... It's friendly. But I think your work has that. I, that's what I hope for. It does. There's some paintings here as well. You want to see them, remember? Incredible. Look, this is what this room looked like. That, that's Barbara. Yeah. Standing over there. Yeah. We're leaning on that fireplace there. Yeah. God, it's as, it's as though she kind of lives on in this place. She seems to have the same lights oh, and this everything. Is cool. Look, this is cool. Sculpture with the bright blue. Amazing. She must have grown up around World War I. Yeah. She escaped World War II by coming here. And actually, even today I feel sort of disconnected in St Ives. But imagine in sort of 1939. But not only disconnected in space, but disconnected in time. Yeah. It does feel like time is different here. Everything's kind of integrated with the landscape here. There's no kind of tall buildings. It's so different to London. Yes, the space around your ears. Yeah. You know, around your head. 
Should we go in the garden now? Yes, let's do that. Wow. It's like a Barbara Hepworth pilgrimage, isn't it? So, this, I, I suppose, is exactly as she left it. Well, she could have seen the sea from here as well. You can just imagine her on her. And, and the church, look. And it's how just, huge this yeah. one is. How did she even get that together? That must have been so heavy. I look, this four is for... square walk through. Do you, do you think that you're meant to be able to walk through it, weren't you? You were. I love the way that the rain's making them as well. Yeah, I do. It's like an added texture. So there's these huge round cutouts. And when you look through, they, they frame another area. And from also different parts, different angles. You know, you can see the sea through this, through her other sculptures. Yes. You just want to climb on it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do more than touch, yeah. You want to climb and walk through it. And, and it's so in keeping with the surrounding. You know, this garden's full of trees and plants and ponds and rocks and almost sometimes you can't even sort of differentiate the sculptures from the actual... No. Uh, ..from nature. Everything seems more exaggerated here. Maybe it's her, her work against the, the nature and it makes nature seem more wonderful. But also, look, there's so much water in that sculpture over there. It really changes the shape of it and the reflections are so yeah. different. Even in the rain, it looks nice. Yeah. I came on the most um, beautiful day last summer. <laughs> and the sun was almost shining through the sculptures, you know, when it could have peeked yeah. through the holes. But there's something about the rain that makes these look like they all look wet and shiny. And I would think they, um, they just take on a different way of being whatever the environment is. So imagine in the snow how it would look. Oh, that would be amazing. And she would have seen it that way, wouldn't she? She'd have seen it in every possible way of weather. And I wonder if that made her then think about the next piece. Mm. Of the, you know, the colour of the stone or how she wanted it to be. How much did she think about how it would look here? They're all just such unusual shapes. It's it's weird because it feels bodily and human form-like, but then alien and... Do you know what I mean? There is a sort of humanness to them. Even that sculpture there looks a kind of like a kind of two people or someone embracing. There's something very harmonious about the work. Yeah. Friendly, like you said, I yeah. love that. It is. Very friendly. Should we go and meet Heidi? Yeah, let's do that out of the rain. Yes, let's go. <laughs> Hi Heidi. Hi. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Hello. Thanks so much for talking to us today. You're welcome. My name is Heidi Corbally. I'm a gallery assistant and tour guide here at the Barbara Hepworth Museum but also at Tates and Times as well. We were particularly intrigued in this work. Yeah, infant, it's beautiful. It's probably one of my favourites in the gallery. When's it from? Uh, 1929. It was just so after... So was that before she had children? It was just after she had, right. had her son. It's made of solid, dark, hard, exotic wood, but it's very, very fleshy, and obviously his arms are raised up and his chest is sticking out and his tummy's sticking in. He looks like he's about to bellow. But my favourite bit has always been the bit at the back. When you walk around it, you can see that gorgeous curve there. Yes. <gasps> It's just That's really, so it, you know, it's such a human part of this sculpture. It's just perfect form. I remember when my little boy was little and I used to just stare yeah. at that tiny bit of his back there. I just, yeah. you know, when, as soon as I started working here and I saw that bit, it really drew yeah. me to the sculpture. I think that's what this sculpture does, though. You know that um, the kind of when you, you have a baby and they're around four months old and they get a bit fat and yeah. you want to bite them? <laughs> <laughs> what were Barbara Hepworth's thoughts on motherhood? Because we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. How you see all that kind of recurring mother and child motif come throughout. She had quite strong ideas about masculinity and femininity and definitely comes out in a lot of her politics as well. Um, a lot of the work that she did um, around nuclear disarmament, she felt that as a mother, as you know, the bringer of people into the world, that you couldn't possibly support something that killed people. Mm. In her writings, she said that motherhood brought her closer to art. You thought that? Yes. I do think that. Because she channelled, you know, after the use of the tripartite forms and everything with, after the triplets have been born. Mm. Yes, yeah, and you see those, those frees all around this museum, actually. What interests you about Barbara Hepworth? Why do you like working here? 
I'm really interested in her kind of the social responsibility she thought she had as an artist to people, um, especially in sort of the middle part of her career and towards the end of her career. She really felt that modern art was important for healing people, especially after the Second World War. And that's why you see a lot of her public art. She really believed that public art was kind of bringing art into public spaces. So that's the friendliness, yeah, isn't it? But your work, you've done a few public art works as well, like with the hospital rooms. Oh, yes, yes. I think you think very differently when you know the environment that the piece is for. It felt like a responsibility with the hospital rooms because the, the painting was going to be in a mental health unit for women, so it had to be healing. You, yeah. I wanted it to be something that people would enjoy looking at, but maybe calming, yeah. but also with, um, with a reference to the situation they found themselves in. Yeah. And do you think she was a feminist figure? I um, take a slightly different view. I think that she definitely inspired women artists, perhaps on a secondary basis. Um, I personally think through her writings and her interviews, she didn't particularly hold a strong idea of fighting for women's rights. It wasn't her responsibility. She didn't feel like it was her responsibility to do that, but she truly felt we were equal and that we weren't in competition. Do you think that when you look at uh, a woman's art that you can tell that they're a woman? No, unless it's kind of outwardly feminist art, but no, I don't think so. No. I mean, it's just the way that art history's been written, isn't it? So many of the history books leave out women artists. That's why we don't know them. You know, there are, there are so many who were before even 1900. It's just the fact that there are just one book in the British Library that you have to wait 24 hours to see or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's sad. It's sad. But she, there was no way she was going to be hidden, was there? No. <laughs> she didn't think that marriage and children were a barrier. In a lot of her writings, she says that they, they complimented her completely and they helped her make, become the artist she was as well. Um, I think maybe if she was a fisherman's daughter from Penzance, it'd be slightly different, but I think that um, she was very strong-minded... Thanks so much, Thank Heidi. Thank you. Museums, I mean, for me, have just... They've shaped my life. The first time I ever took the tube in London, I went to go see the Chrysophilia at Tate Britain. Yes. And you can just be immersed in this other world, in this almost, like, temple-like space, mm. and just absorb other people's sort of vision of the world. As a child, I was always in the v &A because we went there on a school trip when I was about eight, and then as soon as I was old enough to get the train, that's where I was in the V&A. I've always been, I've always, much to my detriment really, always looked and not taken in the names, probably because I'm not very, I, I'm not good at remembering names. But my, you're an artist, you're a visual, visual yeah, person maybe. Yeah, so I would just look, but it doesn't, it's not, it's not so good when you need to talk about things because I know a lot of female artists, say, yeah. but I can't really pronounce their names. <laughs> yeah. Which is really... But that's just me, I guess. I was always just obsessed with seeing everything. I, mean, I still am. It's funny with my Instagram. Um, at home, you know, when I was about age... From age about 14 or something, I kept these kind of black moleskin diaries of yeah. exhibitions I went to. It's almost like reviews, but it's so funny. When I got a laptop age 16, I started using thesaurus. <laughs> so after that, nothing really made sense. So you've been doing this for years, really, haven't you? Yeah. Since childhood. Yeah. Oh, look, who's this? Is a cat. My name's Andrea, and I've worked here for 18 years. And this cat's been coming, this particular cat's been coming for the last eight years or so. And we never see where he came from. And we, we put paper collars on him to say, you know, do you know that your cat is at the Hepworth Museum all day and where, where does he live? Um, but no one ever replies. It's a mystery. And the, the thing is, eight years ago, before he started coming, another one did exactly the same oh, thing. Really? And Hepworth was a real cat person, so... That's kind of magical, yeah, isn't it? It is magical. Uh, Do you feed him? Well, we didn't at first because we didn't think it would be fair to feed him, but then he started killing the wood pigeons. Oh, did he? And um, <laughs> it wasn't really a very good look for yeah, the visitors. So yes. now half the staff have convinced themselves that he's, 
he's really hungry and best life of a cat ever i think yeah, yeah and there's a there's a i know it sounds like a pun but there's a kitty now that all the stuff <laughs> put money into and does he go out into the garden and hang around the sculptures yeah he climbs into the he climbs into when that door's open on a sunny day yeah he must have such fun in that garden yeah So now we're going to go meet Sarah, who's the curator at Tate's and Ives. Okay. And we're going to meet her at Conversation with Magic Stones here in the garden. Lovely. Great. Hello. Hi, I'm Katie. Oh, hello, Katie. Nice to meet so you. So nice to Hi. meet you. Hi. Hi, I'm Helen. Hi, Hi Helen. Lovely Hi. to see you. Thank you. I'm Sarah Matson, and I'm Exhibitions and Displays Curator here at Tate's and Ives. These are kind of polyhedral forms, which are all apparently the same, but they're just put on different faces. And what I love about this work is that um, you get a compendium of ideas that um, Hepworth is thinking about. Um, there is a sense of geometry. Um, there's a relationship to uh, the pagan landscape, you know, with these yeah, sort of standing stones and many yeah. ears. You know, she invites you in to participate with that work, with the work, in the same way as you came through Four Square Walkthrough, that you're yeah. invited to sort of commune with the sculpture. Yeah. And we love the way that the water creates such a different texture in so many of the works as well. Yeah. Like that one over there, you can almost see like a pool emerging yeah. in the bottom of it, which totally changes the reflection. And... Do you want to go and have a look at that? Yeah. So we're standing in front of River Form, which um, is a bronze, and you know she's contrasted in her usual fashion the interior of the work, which has you know clearly been carved out in the original form. But what's lovely about this work, and now it's placed in the garden, mm. is of course it does something else. It collects water in yeah, its. It's called River Form, and yeah. there's almost like a river yeah. in it. It's crazy. Exactly. What we were looking at with her timeline was the fact that you know she was exhibiting around the world, you know, even in her 20s, 20s and 30s. I mean, where did she get that determination? Do you think she even faced many challenges in her life? I th oh gosh, yes. You know, she was um, not only a woman artist uh, working in a world that was very much, you know, a male-dominated uh, profession, but she was a sculptor. Her contemporaries were, you know, kind of um, the big guns of the sculptural world, Henry Moore, for example. But I think, um, you know, one of the things about Hepworth was the fact that she was a consummate networker and um, she knew very carefully and very strategically how to promote her work and put mm. herself in a position where um, she would gain, you know, a certain amount of critical acclaim. You know, she was constantly creating opportunities for herself, you know, from exhibitions. She knew key writers of the time, for example, like Herbert Reed and um, uh, Paul Hodan, and undertake, you know, big commissions like, for example, Winged Figure, you know, in the early 1960s, as well as um, Single Form, which, you know, stands outside of um, the UN. Are we allowed to look in the workshop? Yes, of course. Wow. So I've just brought you into the stone carving studio and uh, we've just come through the yard where she carved. And is it exactly as it was? You've still got a sense of all of her tools and um, working materials from sandpapers. Um, you know, there's still marble chippings here. Incredible. Yeah. But you've got, you know, um, sculptures in progress here. So, you know, the sort of start um, of the form being chipped away yeah. and, you know, the texture of the marble being shown here. So it's very strong. Yes. Well, she was exceptionally tenacious in character and, um, you know, physically. I mean, her health was deteriorating towards, you know, the end of her life. But, um, yes, in the 70s, she um, carved an extraordinary number of marble works. In my own work, when I'm very, very stressed or upset, I find working quite difficult. I have a feeling it was the opposite for her. She probably chiselled yeah. away, hammered in yeah. to get that anger out or something. Maybe. Yeah, but the, the work doesn't come across it as angry in any way. No. There seems to be forever a kind of softness of gentleness, like everything's rounded and... Yeah. ..and uh, very maternal, really. The um, work that's in the studio. Do you want to go and have a look, actually? Yeah. Should we go and talk about that? So this is a sculpture with colour, which is one of a series of works that she'd started um, just as she was leaving London. And so she'd started stringing in the late 1930s. Yeah. And, you know, it 
begins this kind of dialogue with these um, sort of oval forms and, you know, um, her interest in kind of um, articulating both the core and the surface of the work and the kind of tension between the two of them. This series of work that, uh, you know, has this sort of intense colour um, that's also sort of played out in a number of drawings that she made sort of throughout, you know, the war years when... Um, materials were very scarce and time was scarce and she was looking after the children and she's yeah. working on her lap you know in her bedroom you know they have this um, beautiful kind of primary colours that highlight the um, you know very centre or core of these forms. Can you tell us a bit about Epiduros? So Epiduros was one of the sculptures that um, she made following her trip in 1954 um, to the Greek islands with Margaret Gardner. Paul Skeeping, her son, died in 1953 um, in the RAF uh, over Malaya. That must Quite have a been lot the of most loss. traumatic, to lose her son. To lose her son and yeah. also, um, you know, in the, in the early 50s, her marriage was dissolving from uh, Ben Nicholson. Right. And, you know, this sense of maternal, you know, is very much um, prevalent in this um, group of works. So much of her work seems to be about embrace yeah. and kind of yeah. protectiveness. Yeah. And there's this kind of larger shape, maybe the mother or something, and then there's very fragile strings or fragile kind of twists and turns with the bronze or the plaster or the marble or something. There's something very vulnerable about the work as well. I think... I think her work, you know, is very much about um, her response to the world. She wanted to make work that was kind of an antidote to the war, an antidote to tragedy. It's not uh, getting stuck with the war. It wasn't trying to express that. It was yes. trying to express yes. what it could be, what we could have. Yes. It's lovely. Mm-hmm. If you think um, what the work was about, like the, her reaction to the Second World War yeah. was very feminine in itself. It, it wasn't about talking about the aggression of the Second World War. It was about finding hope and love, really, mm. you know, and, and gentleness. And that's what, what everybody needed to be healed. And I felt so emotional because so often I think... I can feel like my work needs to shock or be aggressive in some way to make an impact. Uh, And it just made me feel so much better about what I do. My work is just the way that it comes out. And that's it. How can work be so different yet it wants to express a very similar way? And what are your thoughts on Barbara Hepworth being one of the most prominent female artists ever? I mean, I've worked with Hepworth, I like to think, um, for sort of 17 years now. I'm continually inspired by her achievements and how she forged a career for herself Mm -hmm. at quite a difficult time. I think there's so much more to explore and discover about her work, but I'm also overwhelmed by the endurance that it has, you know, and the fact that you can put her work within a mixed show of artists, modern and contemporary, and she stands up every time. But, you know, interest in her work continues to grow. People are discovering her work and exploring her work and reinterpreting her work all the time, and I think, you know, that's a mark of a really significant artist. Thank okay. you so much, Sarah. It's, it's so nice to meet you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. It was lovely. Today. Thank you. Thank you. So we're back where we started. We are. God, what a day. It was incredible. It's a great museum. I think one of the, the best museums I've ever been to. Really a mind-blowing place, isn't it? You just feel so connected to the work when you actually see where it's made as well and you see where she looked out of every day, where she lived, where she carved, where she sculpted. Yeah. It's a bit like a religious experience, really, that garden. It's so harmonious. Yes, it is. You get a really uh, almost meditative, isn't it? Yeah. When we were standing inside that large sculpture, yeah. that was just... I couldn't believe how big it was. You know, you're completely consumed by these, by these works. Yes, yes. And she clearly had such a modern sense of the world, like, you know, yes. how um, Heidi and Sarah are telling us. You know, she believed in equality from the get-go. Yes, and she put that across so strongly because when, when we were talking about her work being friendly, we had no idea at that point yeah. of this was a reaction to the Second World War. We didn't yeah. know that. She has managed to transmit the feelings into 80 years onwards, yeah. like a radio. She's like a, a radio. You know, going somewhere like the Hepworth 
museum and sculpture garden. Yeah. It just gives me so much joy. And I just think she is such a sort of trailblazer for women and aspiring women artists and aspiring artists, you know, to actually just do what you want and to be so immersed in your medium. You know, you could just tell she loved it. And also being so determined to yes. create what they do. I wonder if women do have to be more determined than men. Like, she just seemed to me that she was just absolutely single-minded about where she wanted her work to be, how she wanted it to be seen. She didn't doubt for one minute that it was less valid than, yeah. say, Henry Moore's. Yeah, but it's interesting that she then resided somewhere like here where you just know that St Ives was somewhere where she was just totally immersed in yeah. with her life, with her family, yes. but also with the landscape. And I think that probably gave her so much joy. Power. You could just And power. Yeah. You could just tell she loved yeah. where we are right now. Yeah, I think she felt powerful here. Mm. Because she really is the iconic St Ives artist. Yeah, amazing. She's a kick-ass woman, wasn't she? Yeah. I mean, the thing about Hepworth is that it's not as though there aren't, there weren't any f artists who were women in the early 20th century in the round, around the time that she was working. Yeah. It's the fact that they weren't exhibited, they weren't collected by the museums, they weren't written about. You know, it's all about scholarship and education and preserving these artworks by these artists, men and women. Primarily, it's artists. You know, why, why, are, why are we still splitting people into categories? Yeah. That's the, the thing about art, is that it must transcend all of that. Those labels, whether you're male, female, gay, it's about the bigger picture of what the work is, is saying. No, I totally agree. I think, you know, one of the reasons why I celebrate specifically women is just because there's so much work to be done, mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to go the other way. And I totally agree with you, you know, never categorise anything. But I want to say, look, here they are, they need to be included into the canon of art history. So it's the kind of thing where someone might be studying for their GCSEs and they might follow my Instagram and they see an artwork and I hope that it doesn't even come across that they are categorising whether an artwork is by a man or a woman. You were saying earlier that the National Gallery has 1% of works by women. Yeah. And not all of them are on display. And that's yes. why we don't know about as many women artists because they haven't been collected by museums. Yeah, so we're going to change that, Helen. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Meet Me at the Museum with me, Katie Hessel. And me, unskilled worker at the Barbara Hepworth Museum and Sculpture Garden here at St Ives. If you like this episode of the podcast, please rate, subscribe or tell a friend. And don't forget, if you've got a National Art Pass, you can get free entry or discounts on museums all around the country.